I don't know if you know this, we took the entire we can still go around. So we took the entire high school down to Mother Eye to see the movie. Um, you know, at the beginning of the school year in July. So a lot of the high schoolers and staff have, have seen the film, um, which was a great, you know, kind of a really wonderful, it was really a bonding experience for the entire high school at the beginning of the school year. Um, and it was, it was really, it was more important, made more significant by the fact that they knew that a Cody School grad, you know, wrote the source material for the movie. So that really made it exciting for all of us. So, yeah. Oh, terrific. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, it was interesting before we started. It was interesting because uh, I think when you attended KIS, it was primarily American. You might have had a few Europeans and a few Indians. When we went to see the movie, I was thinking about this. We have a lot of Indian students, we have American students, but we also have Russian students and German students uh, all watching Oppenheimer, which I found fascinating as well. <laughs> right. Uh, we have these different cultures and uh, all pertinent to the, you know, to, to the to the uh, to the book of the story. So it was great to get their 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 reflections as well. So. All right, it looks like it is just about time. So we'll start on the stroke of 8 p.m. here and 10.30 a.m. for you. Everyone ready? Can you hear us in alumni hall? All right. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Well, here we go. Good evening, everyone, uh, both here in Cody as well as across the world. Um, welcome to an evening with uh, Dr. Kai Bird. Dr. Bird is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian and journalist. He is currently the executive director and distinguished lecturer at the City University of New York Graduate Center's Leon Levy Center for Biography. He most recently authored The Outlier, The Unfinished Presidency of Jimmy Carter, his biography of Robert Ames, The Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames, was a New York Times bestseller. As the audience knows, in 2006, he co-authored and received the Pulitzer for American Prometheus, the Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert, Opp J. Robert Oppenheimer, upon which the 2023 movie Oppenheimer is primarily based. Cody's school is mentioned in Dr. Kyberg's brilliant memoir, Crossing Mandelbaum's Gate, Coming of Age Between the Arabs and Israelis, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. As if that wasn't enough, he has also written biographies of John J. McCloy, George Bundy, and William Bundy. He received an honorary doctorate from Carleton College in Minnesota. He lives in New York City, in Washington, D.C., and in my, um, and Miami Beach with his wife, Susan Goldmark. And finally, he is here with us tonight because he is a member of the wonderful Cody class of 1969. Dr. Kai, uh, Kai Bird, on behalf of the students and staff of KIS, thank you for being with us this evening, this evening here and this morning where you are. Thanks so much. Um, before, we, before we hear from Dr. Bird, I will say a word about the format this evening and introduce our panelists. Uh, Jisha Matthew represents our physics department. Amita Kaushik is here from our humanities department. And Ruth Godwin joins us from the English department. The panel is symbolic, I think, in the sense that understanding American Prometheus involves crucial perspectives from far-flung disciplines and fields of study. It is, uh, it, 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 is a, it is a biography, and it so happens that some of our English students are studying biography. It is about, to put it mildly, an important breakthrough in the field of physics. Um, and it is ultimately also a study of global politics, which Ms. Amita teaches here at KIS. 
The panel therefore represents the complexity and multidisciplinary nature inherent in the study of the life and times of Jacob Robert Oppenheimer. After Dr. Bird addresses us, we will have questions from our students who are here. Uh, can students wave, please? Can we see you? Are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, there you are. Uh, who are attending this, evening, this event appropriately from Alumni Hall, along with our alumni coordinator, Ms. Manjusha, and our English department chair, Justin Bird. And we will also have some questions from us, the panelists. So that is what our evening looks like. Uh, Dr. Bird, um, welcome and over to you, sir. Well, thank you, sir. It's a real pleasure to be able to do this, to sort of revisit Cody virtually <laughs> uh, via the wonders of technology. Um, so I thought I'd just talk a, a, a little bit about my journey as a journalist and biographer. Uh, you know, I finished high school at Cody in 1969 and uh, <clears throat> went off to Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, where I spent my first North American winter <laughs> and uh, managed to survive that winter. It was a shock um, in, in terms of the weather. Um, and I think I went to college thinking, you know, I was interested in politics. Um, the Vietnam War was still raging. Uh, one of the first things I had to do when I turned up in Northfield, Minnesota was to register for the draft. Um, and I, I, I thought probably after college, I'd probably end up going to law school. But, you know, uh, a liberal arts education exposes you to a lot of different things. And I, uh, in the course of the four years, I, I became obsessed and captivated by the idea of journalism. And uh, I had gone, I had taken, I persuaded my history professor at Carleton to allow me to do an independent study in my junior year and uh, go back to India. Uh, and this was literally, I landed in India on the last day of the war between Pakistan and India in December of 1971. And I managed to get myself into the newly created Bangladesh uh, just a few weeks later and spent uh, a month there. And I was ostensibly writing a paper about the involvement of the university students in the Bangladesh revolution. But I was hanging out in truth with a CBS TV crew who let me tag along. And I, it was just very exciting. I was swept up by the notion of, you know, being uh, a witness to history and uh, being able to go anywhere and ask people questions. And, uh, and uh, so I came, I, I I finished college and, and uh, immediately went back overseas and tried to freelance in the Middle East and, and in India. And uh, it, was, it was terrific. It was a great adventure for about a year, um, traveling around the Middle East, Cairo, Israel, um, and then actually making my way by land all the way from, uh, Jerusalem all the way to New Delhi and eventually Dhaka and revisiting Bangladesh. Anyway, I got caught up with, with journalism, went to journalism school, got a master's in one year, um, and uh, eventually got a job in Newsweek. And uh, I lasted there about six months and then was fired because I just didn't fit into the sort of weekly news magazine style. Um, I was always writing too long and my, you know, my pieces were too long. Anyway, I, I eventually landed uh, as a, at the age of 26, I landed a job as an uh, assistant editor at the Nation Magazine, which is America's oldest weekly publication. And, uh, 
there I I wasn't paid very much, but I had a lot of fun. I, I it was I, I worked literally 10, 12 hours a day editing, um, planning the magazine's weekly issues, writing editorials. Um, and you know, it was terrific training. And I did that for about five years and and at some point I decided that, you know, I, I needed to, as a journalist, I should, it was time to try to write a book. <laughs> um, I was a little naive in my, my aspirations, but um, so I, initially I thought I wanted to do a book. This was in 1980. So it was right after the 79 energy crisis with long gas lines in America and price of gasoline had skyrocketed to over a dollar a gallon, which was, um, <laughs> sounds cheap today, but <laughs> it was scandalous then. Anyway, I wanted to, to do a book about uh, big oil, the American oil companies and their influence over U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and I started researching to write a pr book proposal on this topic. And in the course of the early research, I stumbled across the name of John J. McCloy, who uh, I had to, I had never heard of him. I had to look him up in Who's Who, and realized that uh, in this one little paragraph resume of his career, that uh, John McCloy was probably one of the most powerful private citizens in America. He was a Wall Street lawyer who had been Assistant Secretary of War during World War II. He been involved in the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan. He interned the Japanese Americans in concentration camps. Uh, after the war, he became president of the World Bank. Uh, then he became high commissioner to uh, occupied Germany for three years. Then in the 1950s, he became chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, one of the largest banks in America closely aligned with the Rockefeller family. And uh, at the same time, he was chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations and chairman of the Ford Foundation, their trustees, and a close advisor, private advisor to President Dwight Eisenhower. I, you know, he, he, he was just everywhere, always behind the scenes. So I refocused my book proposal to do a book, a biography and wrote a long proposal and managed to sell it to a publisher and got an advance. And I thought I'd spend two and a half years writing this biography and it didn't come out for 10 years. It took me 10 years to write that book. And, uh, you know, it, by the time it came out in 1992, I was really no longer a journalist. Uh, I couldn't get a job as a reporter. People looked at me and said, well, you've gotten, you've written this huge book. It got reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review. You're gonna write another book, aren't you? Anyway, I, I, I ended up writing another book proposal for a biography of the Bundys. And again, they were interesting to me because they were, um, sort of patrician Boston Brahmin uh, individuals who uh, Mac Bundy was Harvard Dean uh, and he became national security advisor to John F. Kennedy and then Lyndon Johnson. And he became one of the major architects of the war in Vietnam. And yet I realized he was a liberal and, uh, you know, a former Harvard Dean, he wasn't stupid. And yet he had gotten America into this terrible war. And that motivated my, I was curious about, you know, how did that happen? So that, you know, you, you have to have a really strong motivation to write a biography because it takes so long. And it's such a lonely um, existence. You can't you can't write unless you're sitting alone hour after hour every day. And uh, anyway, that 
I, that book took me seven years. So I'm getting faster, right? <laughs> the first book took 10, the second was seven. Um, and it came out in 98. And uh, again, I was sort of unemployed for a while. And in 1999, my uh, friend, colleague named Martin J. Sherwin approached me and uh, suggested that I should join him on his project. Uh, I, initially, I said, no, Marty, I, I can't do that. I like you too much. <laughs> because uh, he was a very likable, charismatic history professor at Tufts University in Boston. Um, and I knew the sort of their, the pitfalls of trying to co-author uh, co author anything, but let alone a big biography. But Marty had been working on Oppenheimer since 1980, almost 20 years. And he'd collected uh, 50,000 pages of archival documents, including 7,000 pages of FBI documents on, on Oppenheimer. He'd interviewed 150 of Oppenheimer's friends and colleagues and physicists and uh, <clears throat> but he hadn't started to write. Uh, he had sort of gotten biographer's disease, which is common. Um, it, it afflicts biographers who sort of always believe there's one more archive or one more interview they need to do before they can start to write. <laughs> and uh, that was the case for Marty. But, you know, by... The year 2000, he was lobbying me to join him. And, uh, uh, you know, finally he jokingly said, well, you know, if you don't join me on this Oppenheimer project, uh, my tombstone is going to read, he took it with him. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, he, he, he was very persuasive, and I understood that this was a, a great subject. Um, and uh, we started writing together in 2000, and it still took five years for the book to come out. Um, it's, you know, it's a long book, it's 720 pages of text and uh, hundreds and hundreds of footnotes. And it's a complicated story. Um, and Oppenheimer is a sort of mysterious, elusive figure. Um, but we can talk about that in a bit. Anyway, after Oppenheimer came out in 2005, it won the Pulitzer in 2006. And uh, just before that happened, uh, the book was optioned for film. So Marty and I were quite excited. Um, and then nothing happened. The years rolled by and <laughs> several scripts were written. They weren't very good. And uh, by 2021, uh, Marty and I had given up hope that any, any film would be made. Um, Hollywood sort of talked a good story, but uh, there was never, never any real progress. Um, so I, I went back to writing another book. I had tackled a memoir uh, called Crossing Mandelbaum Gate. And I did that because I, I, I you know, was curious to know more about what had happened all around me when I was growing up as a child, the son of a foreign service officer in the Middle East. I grew up in Jerusalem, Beirut, uh, Cairo, Saudi Arabia, and then India. And uh, you know, after the 67 war, uh, my father was an Arabist in the State Department, so he had learned Arabic language and he'd spent most of his career in the Middle East. But after the 67 war, uh, most Arab states broke relations with the United States. And so there were no jobs for Arabists in the Middle East. <laughs> they shipped them off to Bombay instead. And thus, that's why I ended up in 1968 and 69 going to finishing high school in, in Cody Canal. Um, anyway, I, I ended up writing that book, um, which is sort of a blend of memoir and history to try to explain all the wars that had happened in the Middle East. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was fun, but it was very different from a biography. 
Uh, anyway, that came out in 2010. And then I, my next project was a biography of a CIA officer named Robert Ames. And he uh, had actually been my next door neighbor in Dahran, Saudi Arabia. He lived right next door. I thought he was a foreign service officer like my father, but uh, it turned out he was a clandestine CIA officer who was operating undercover as a foreign service officer. And uh, he had, one day I was reading the newspaper and, and read that he had died in, a, in the first truck bomb attack on a US embassy in Beirut in 1983. And that was uh, a stunning revelation, a shock. And I was curious again to know what had been his journey, what had happened, who had killed him, what he had done in the Middle East as a CIA officer. And uh, uh, again, you know, biography is very arduous. It's a very tough form of scholarship. It's unending in terms of the research, but it can be a lot of fun too. It's a treasure hunt. And in this case, you know, most biographies, most of my biographies are based on a lot of archival work, collecting thousands of pages of archival material, letters, diaries. But in the case of a CIA officer, you know, their, their business is secrecy. So you know, there were no archives and the CIA was not opening up its files to me. Um, so I had to, most of that book is based on interviews uh, where I tracked down retired CIA officers who had known, Oppen uh, had known Robert Ames and uh, interviewed them, got them to talk. And uh, I was, you know, pretty successful in recreating what Ames did in the Middle East and how he died. It's a, it's a mystery story that was sort of solved with a lot of detective work. Um, so that book came out in 2014. And, you know, then I was sort of unemployed and wondering what to do next. And uh, I had always been curious about Jimmy Carter, uh, who had been a one-term president from 77 to 81, and uh, a liberal Southerner. And uh, anyway, I wrote a proposal, managed to sell it, and uh, spent six years working on that, uh, spending a lot of time in his presidential archives. And uh, it, it, was, it was, again, a, a difficult journey. Um, you know, a president is a very complicated subject to write about because every day, you know, he handles not one issue, but dozens of things, domestic, foreign policy, um, and his papers are, you know, well, there are two million pages of classified materials in Jimmy Carter's presidential library, and about 80% of them are declassified. But, you know, I couldn't possibly read two million pages, but you, I spent six months, about six months in his archives off and on, and uh, you know, you, you have to make choices. And, uh, and at the same time, you have to recreate what the man himself was like, um, his private life, his marriage, his personal politics, his ethics. His, um, and so it's, a, again, it's a, it's a blend. But I, anyway, to sum up, I, you know, I started off as a journalist and that was very good training teaching me to write. But I, by accident, really drifted into biography. And um, I'm very glad I did. I think it's the best form of history, the best vehicle for conveying human storytelling, um, because precisely it's focused on one person. And we're always, you know, we human beings are always curious about the other life and how the other, you know, how one human being 
goes through history and what choices he or she makes. And, um, and in telling the, the life story of any, any person, famous or non-famous, you, you know, it's, it's a challenge. But along the way, you learn not only about the person, but about the society around them. And uh, you, you convey a lot of history and understanding. And we human beings are desperate to understand the world around us. And uh, I'll, I'll just add that, you know, Oppenheimer was particularly fascinating as a physicist. He was sort of a nerdy young man who happened to to uh, sort of come of age in the 1920s, just as quantum physics was being discovered. And uh, he had a exactly the right kind of mind to explore this new science. Um, quantum is very hard to understand for any human being. <laughs> it's the science of the small as such, and it explains the world. It explains our physical world and how it works. But Oppenheimer was himself particularly good at that, um, pre be precisely because he was a polymath. He wasn't just a scientist. He actually had an interest in uh, literature and the poetry of T.S. Eliot, and, uh, and uh, he loved the novels of Ernest Hemingway. And, uh, he loved New Mexico. He'd gone out to New Mexico from New York City, where he'd grown up as a young man one summer. And he fell in love with the high plains of New Mexico and horseback riding and this very Spartan cowboy existence. Um, and, you know, he, he was a polymath. He, in, in the 1930s, he um, suddenly became interested in... Uh, Hindu, the Hindu script, uh, scriptures, and so much so that he learned Sanskrit, uh, at least enough Sanskrit so that he could read the Gita in the original. And uh, at the same time, he was, you know, exploring quantum physics and dark holes, black hole theory, and um, and managing uh, a handful of graduate students. Anyway, he's he's a really fascinating character. And I think if you have all seen the film, you can see what a sort of mysterious and charismatic young man he was. Um, let's see, I, I guess I've gone on a little long, <laughs> uh, but that was, that's in some, that's my sort of biographical journey. Um, I, I think I've been very fortunate to sort of stumble into it. And I, I can talk about my next, I have a new project already and uh, we can talk about that too. But why don't we open it up for questions? And thank you so much, Dr. Bird. That, that's fascinating taking us through that. Uh, just on your point about learning about cultures through biographies, I think I learned more I had more insight into say the African American experience in the Deep South by reading Jimmy the the Jimmy Carter biography. I mean that was just a perfect example of that. I wanted before I have a question, um, but before that, I just want to respond to a few things that you have in Mandelbaum's gay uh, in in uh, you know your book about your memoir uh, about Cody School, and I just want you to know a few things. One is that uh, chapel is no longer mandatory. Uh, <laughs> at mass, first of all. Secondly, I think I want I want you and others to know that the principal no longer measures the distance between the boys and the girls with a ruler at the dances. <laughs> right. Just I just want you to know that that's uh, it's no longer the reality. Oh, well, I, I, I think that's progress. <laughs> we'll, we'll call it, you know, after 50 years, it's no longer happened. So there's a little progress there. Uh, no, but I think that's the, be the brilliant thing about, about, you know, Cody School, now called KIS, is that um, a lot of things have changed. But I, I think that any current student reading your, uh, you know, Beyond Man of Gate would, would relate to certain aspects that you wrote about. 
you know, and, and still recognize very much, um, you know, the, the school you grew up in with the school they are now attending. Um, but this is a great question, and because it is from one of your former English teachers here at Cody School, Mr. Bob Granner, um, who still comes to Cody. Um, and he says, as one of your teachers here in Cody School many years ago, I would like to ask you to reflect on your early education, um, how some of those experiences in your youth led to your becoming a writer, and specifically how your life in India and other countries outside the U.S. affected your viewpoint about America, kind of that third culture perspective. Third, you know, and he goes on to say, thank you, Kai, we're all so proud to know you. But uh, I think that's a really interesting question. You know, how, how did your time at Cody School, your early years, your time outside America, you know, change or, or you know, kind of like impact how you came to understand America in, in your various books? Yes, well, I, I very much was an expatriate growing up as a child in, in the Middle East and then India. And... Uh, when I went back to America, I was to go to college, I was sort of very much a fish out of water. I, I didn't know how to drive a car. I didn't know how to use a pay phone. I'd never, you know, gone shopping in a supermarket <laughs> Safeway, or uh, I, I didn't understand American culture. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I have to say I'm still a little uh, a little bit weird here in America. You notice I'm wearing a Nehru jacket. Um, nice. <laughs> and uh, I do this because, uh, you know, I fell in love with Nehru jackets and collars and, and uh, Indian clothing when I was living in, in the subcontinent. And uh, I hate wearing a tie, <laughs> so so this is a good solution, and uh, it reminds me of my my roots in in Cody. Um, yeah, no, you know, uh, I, I I think the 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 experience of being growing up as an expatriate is extremely valuable. Uh, particularly as an American, but anywhere, you know, it gives you uh, a grounding in the fact that the world is a large place and uh, it's filled with many different kinds of people and religions and politics and cultures and food. And, um, you know, it's, if you grow up in one place, you're, you're, you're pretty provincial. So I I had an advantage in in having that kind of childhood I think uh, while it was tough coming back to America and and learning to immerse myself and and find my way in American culture uh, you know it it gave me the expatriate experience gave me uh, a freedom to sort of be a foreign correspondent I had a certain distance. I could look at uh, American life um, as a foreign correspondent. So you, you mentioned the Jimmy Carter biography, which a, a lot of it is about Southern culture and the issue of race and racism in America. And uh, I think I could do that because I sort of approached the subject as a foreign correspondent. <laughs> like, you know, South Georgia is a really foreign place to <laughs> anyone who uh, grew up in the Middle East and India, let alone Washington, D.C. or New York. Uh, and if you realize that it's sort of a foreign place, you, uh, you uh, can understand and see things that the people in South Georgia don't. Um, uh, anyway, so yeah, I think Cody had a, a, a huge influence on my um, out, outlook and it made me unafraid to go anywhere it made me as I mentioned you know in college I I wasn't afraid to 
propose an independent study and go off to Bangladesh in the midst of a of the Indo-Pak War. Um, and I thought nothing of that actually. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I know that there's a lot of people clamoring to ask questions. So this is from our English department. I think we'll have one question from the English department. Ms. Ruth. Okay, hi, Dr. Bird. So interestingly, the Newsweek, the very organization that fired you for writing too long, uh, reviewed your 720 page book uh, on the life of Oppenheimer and reviewed, Oppenheimer's life does not influence us, it haunts us. The biographies often have a unique narrative voice. So what considerations did you make when choosing the narrative perspective and tone for American Prometheus to convey the complexity of Oppenheimer's character? Well, you know, all biography is, um, it's basically chronological. So unlike any other format in history, um, you have sort of a formula. You're, you, you've got to sort of tell the whole life. And usually you start at the beginning <laughs> um, and you work your way chronologically. And that's how this book was written, American Prometheus. But, uh, you know, you're, you're also, as the biographer, you, you, you can't possibly know the whole life. You have to have a certain humility, you, you know, to understand that there are some things about any life that are never going to be known. Um, and you have to make choices. You know, it's a long, a 720 page book is pretty long, but it can't possibly uh, tell the whole story. So you have to decide what to leave out and what to put in. Um, and you're a storyteller. It's uh, it's sort of a novel with footnotes, <laughs> a novel with footnotes. And uh, anyway, we wrote Marty and I wrote the book chronologically. But then when we came to sort of looking at the full manuscript, um, we made a big effort to sort of choose how to open up the book. So if you recall we have a sort of introduction prologue that uh, doesn't start with Oppenheimer's birth, nothing so prosaic as that, but starts instead with him being informed that uh, by Lewis Straws that he has had this sort of letter of indictment filed against him. And he's going to, he has a choice about whether to um, fight it or um, go through a security hearing and he goes to see his lawyer and is at his lawyer's home in Georgetown up in Washington DC and and he goes to the bathroom and faints and his wife and friends can't get him out of the bathroom door because his body is shoved up against the closed door it's a very dramatic and you know he it shows the Oppenheimer in crisis and in and vulnerable, and it shows his humanity. You know, the fact that he was e emotionally um, overwrought about what was about to happen and vulnerable. Um, and <clears throat> Marty and I also each chapter, if you notice, we make a big effort to have at the beginning of each chapter and at the end of every chapter some kind of uh, colorful anecdote, um, uh, maybe dialogue, uh, but a little story that is captivating and helps to sort of push the reader to turn the page. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We're, we are now to see if the technology works. We're going to switch over to the students. Um, and uh, so Alumni Hall, please come in. Oh, here we go. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. 
Uh, all right. Um, good morning, Dr. Bird. My name is Adhiraj Virg from the class of 2024. And I've got a question for you. It's not too long, but was it a challenge for you to incorporate and bring out the true character and personality of Dr. Oppenheimer in your book? And how exactly did you um, capture his true essence, as well as both the public and private image that you perceived of him through his three or multiple interviews, as well as the effects that everything he went through had on him, especially on paper? Uh, well, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, no, I'll, I'll answer it by telling you a little story about um, one of the few interviews that I did. You know, the book is basically based mostly on Marty Sherwin's research, his 20 years of research on, on Oppenheimer. Um, so when I arrived on the scene, uh, uh, I didn't have to do very much archival research. He had all these documents and interview transcripts. And, um, but as I was writing one day in Washington, DC, I uh, realized that his last secretary, a woman named um, Ann Wilson was still alive. And she was living just a mile away from my home in Washington, DC in Georgetown. And I rang her up and got an interview and went over to her, her home. And we had a delightful interview. And she, you know, she loved Oppenheimer, she admired him. And she related this story, which I think is in the book and is very telling about Oppenheimer's character. So I, I hope that will answer your question. You recall <clears throat> at one point in the book, I, I have her saying that she was walking to work one day in Los Alamos and uh, Oppenheimer was walking with her. And uh, this was in July of 1945, just after the Trinity test that is so dramatically shown in Nolan's Oppenheimer film. Uh, so they knew that the bomb had worked. The gadget had successfully been tested. So they're walking to work, and suddenly she, Anne hears Oppenheimer muttering to himself, those poor little people, those poor little people. And she stops him and says, Robert, what are you talking about? And uh, he says, well, you know, the, the gadget we now know works, and it's going to be used on a Japanese city. And, you know, there is no military target large enough other than a city to, to, to deploy this weapon. And the victims are going to be mostly women and children and old men and civilians, poor little people. So he was worrying about that. But when I went home after this interview and told Marty Sherwin, um, this what I, what Anne had said, he reminded me that well that was the same week that Oppenheimer was also briefing the bombardiers who are going to be on the Enola Gay airplane and drop the first atomic bomb, and he was instructing them at exactly what altitude they should release the bomb, and at what altitude it should be detonated to have the maximum destructive impact to kill as many people as possible. So this is a complicated man, right? He's, <laughs> he's sort of, he's doing his duty. He's paying attention to every detail to make sure that this gadget is as destructive as possible. But at the same time, he's deeply troubled about the tragedy that he is going to be associated with for the rest of his life. And he's worrying about those poor little people. Well, I, I just find that story endlessly fascinating and it shows Oppenheimer's character and personality. And uh, it, it was a great interview. And at the end of the interview with Ann Wilson, just uh, as a footnote, she uh, she went to her library shelf and pulled out a 
large coffee table book of uh, photographs by Alfred Eisenstadt, the famous photographer. And she turned to one page and showed me, you know, this, this image. And I look, looked at it and I said, oh my God, that's, what a stunning photograph. That should be the cover of the book. And uh, indeed, that's, that is the cover of the book. <laughs> um, yeah, it really is a beautiful photo. I think I'm gonna stay, if it's okay, I think I'm gonna stay in Alumni Hall with the students um, and make sure they get their questions. I'm worried if Shreya and Arna, your questions are so similar. Can both of you read your questions? You read your questions one after the other and have Dr. Bird respond to both of them together. Is that okay? Yeah. So Shreya and then, then Arna, can you guys read your questions? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Thank you. Um, hello, Dr. Bird. Um, I'm Shreya Ambrose from the graduating class of 2024. Um, today, I would like to ask you if you could share some insights into your creative process when researching and writing your Pulitzer Prize winning books. And uh, my name is Arna Panigrahi. I'm in grade 10. And my question is, um, how do you stay focused and motivated to complete your years and years long of researching and writing, even with possible hindrances in the progress? Thank you. Okay, well, Actually, you know, it is pretty intimidating to start a book. Uh, you have a blank page <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's hard to begin and it's a daunting process. Uh, you know, it's a long book, all those words. Uh, so I approach it actually with a very simple strategy. Um, I go to sleep at night when I'm writing. And uh, as I'm falling asleep, I ask myself what, what funny, interesting anecdote I can write up tomorrow, tomorrow morning. And uh, I fall asleep and then the next morning I get up and I know I have this little, little tiny anecdote that I'm gonna start with. And uh, that gets me going. Um, and I, then my other rule is that I, I only write for about three hours. Um, I basically spend the morning and my goal is to write very little, maybe 300 words, 350 words. <laughs> if I write a thousand words, it's probably too much. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's, that's not, that's not too difficult to do 300 words a day, right? But if you do it every day and it's part of a structure, a chronological storytelling, um, well, after a, a year or two or three, uh, you have something that is, is beginning to look like a book. So it becomes manageable. And, uh, you know, my wife says I don't work hard enough, only three hours a day. <laughs> but uh, it, that's actually quite a bit. And uh, after you've finished the morning writing, you know, there's always things that you've got to do to prepare for the next day, something to look up. Um, you know, you also only even after the 20 years of research that Marty Sherwin did, uh, you know, you, you only know what you don't know when you start to write. And so you're constantly having to look up things. And so I spend the rest of the day thinking, looking, looking for other material or details that I need from other books or archival documents. Um, and then I go to sleep wondering, dreaming about what funny little anecdote I can write the next day. So that's my, that's my strategy. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and great question, uh, students. I think we'll stay at Alumni Hall, and I think Maya has a question. Thank you, sir. Uh, Good morning, Dr. Bird. My name is Maya. I'm currently in the graduating class of 2024 as well. Um, so firstly, I would like to say congratulations on the success of Oppenheimer as well as the outlier. And I was wondering, I think you were going to talk about this, but I was wondering what's next in store for you. So if there are any new collaborations you're working on, if there are any projects that you're looking forward to, or perhaps like parts of history that you're eager to explore further with your new work. Okay, yeah, no, I do have a new project. Um, last October, I signed a contract with Scribner to do a biography, another biography, <clears throat> of a, a, an American lawyer uh, named Roy Cohn. And uh, he's not terribly well known, but uh, in certain circles, if you mention the name Roy Cohn here in New York City or Washington, uh, usually you get people groaning <laughs> uh, because he is known as a uh, scoundrel. And indeed, my working title is American Scoundrel. He was a lawyer who was the chief, of, chief counsel to Senator Joseph McCarthy during the height of the McCarthy witch hunts in the 1950s. And, uh, you know, he ruined the lives of many people by charging them with being communists and forcing them to name names. And, and uh, then he became a lawyer to all five mob families, the mafioso in New York City. Um, and then in 1973, he was at a uh, private club called the Club 21 here in New York. And at the next table was sitting a young real estate developer named Donald Trump. And they became friends and Roy Cohn became Trump's lawyer for uh, until he died in 1986. Uh, and he taught Donald Trump everything he knew about how to deal with the press, how to always counter sue, how to never apologize, how to tell the big lie. <laughs> uh, he taught Trump the sort of divisive politics that uh, we have here in America today. Um, so it's, it's gonna be a biography of a scoundrel um, of uh, a, a guy who was gay, but always in the closet and in denial about his sexuality. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of a, it, I, I think of it as a biography that will uh, teach me and my readers sort of about the dark side of America. <laughs> it's a very different project from Jimmy Carter, who was a very decent man, he is a, He's still with us. Uh, he is a decent man and was always trying to do the right thing. And uh, Roy Cohn is uh, just about the opposite of that. So, um, but I chose this project because, you know, you, you have to be careful about what projects you land on because they take so long. It's going to take three, four, five years, maybe. I don't know. And uh, you have to live with these people. So you have to have uh, curiosity and, um, and a, you know, obsessive desire to figure things out. And uh, Roy Cohn, I don't know much about the mafia or the gay culture in New York City in the 1970s. Um, I don't know much about his sort of right wing politics or Donald Trump, but um, you know, I'll learn a lot as I go along the way trying to write this book. That sounds and, awesome. and, Thank you, Mr. Bird. Thank you. And uh, our global politics teacher, Amita, just a follow-up to that. Thing. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. You know, this 
question was prepared with your comment in the book, you know, where a line reads, he harshly criticized Soviet tyranny, but lamented the fact that so many Americans were willing to sacrifice their civil liberties in the name of anti-communism. And when you talk just now about whatever you said, you know, this, in my opinion, you know, this entire role of um, historical nonfiction is becoming very, very important. And what do you think, how important is historical nonfiction becoming in the emerging political scenario that we are seeing? And I ask this specifically with reference to uh, you know, fake news and alternative facts, you know, people like you become so important because, I mean, we learn history from your biographies. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's really appalling that we have an internet culture that is now global and so much information is available so in so easily. Um, and yet there's, you know, there, there are no footnotes. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the footnotes are very important. Uh, and I agree with you, non, nonfiction narrative is essential to hold, you know, to build a civilization. Um, facts are important. Now, you know, as a biographer, I'd be the first to um, admit that biography is a subjective um, pursuit. It's my view of Oppenheimer, my view of Jimmy Carter. It's what interests me about their journey. Um, and as I said, you have to make choices about what to write about. And uh, those choices are informed by my biases. And, and that's why uh, the footnotes are very important so that the reader can uh, pick up the book and look at the point of view that the author has and then look at the, check the sources and see exactly what is being cited and to sort of gauge the authenticity of the story that the biographer is trying to tell. So that's why, you know, you need multiple, multiple volumes. <laughs> there are many biographies of Oppenheimer actually. There are many biographies of Jimmy Carter. There are over a thousand biographies of Abraham Lincoln. And we need them because each biographer brings a slightly different point of view and passion. Um, and taken together, you get a, um, a, a, a deeper understanding of Jimmy Carter or Abraham Lincoln or Oppenheimer. Um, but the footnotes are important, and I wish there was a way we could, um, people could understand that in, in, a, in the internet setting, in social media. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're gonna go back to Alumni Hall. I think uh, Shristi has a really interesting question. Uh, so maybe this is the last student question, I think, but it's a great one. Um, good morning, Dr. Bird. This is Sushi Reja from Grade 11. And my question is, your work often dwells into complex political and historical subjects. How do you strike a balance between scholar rigor and accessibility for a broader readership? Yeah, well, the, the story is all important. You want, you, you know, as an author, I want people to read my, my stories. Um, so, you know, Oppenheimer is a theoretical quantum physicist, but uh, you'll note, notice that there, there isn't much physics in the book. <laughs> there, there are no formula. Um, I do attempt to explain quantum physics and what Oppenheimer was working on, black hole theory, um, but I, you know, I don't go into it in in the way that a actual quantum physicist would write a paper, um, I you know I have to. I, I'm the guy who 
in college, I did take a physics course, but uh, it was called Physics for Poets. <laughs> and, uh, and that was important, actually, to sort of help me to understand, uh, you know, the simple basi basics of uh, physics and the scientific quest. But, you know, uh, my, my interest as the biographer is to explain uh, not quantum physics, but to explain Oppenheimer the man. And uh, I want you to understand his personality, his insecurities, his vulnerabilities as a young man. You know, he had a near nervous breakdown at the age of 22 um, in the so-called poison apple incident that's depicted in both the book and, and in the film. And, you know, that's very important to humanize him. I, I want to convey a human, um, the human complexity of, of, you know, he's not just a brilliant scientist. He's also uh, someone who has faults. He had a long marriage, but he also had affairs. Um, he, uh, he was a charismatic leader. And yet when confronted and challenged about his loyalty to America in this terrible kangaroo court um, security hearing, he sort of fell apart, right? As you can see in the film, he, he's incapable of defending himself very well. His wife, Kitty, does a better job of that. Anyway, it's, it's as I said, it's always, you're always making choices and they're very subjective. Uh, they're what I think are important. Um, but you want to make sure that you tell a story that people are going to turn the page for. So that, I guess that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. For that. I think, I think what I appreciate, all of us appreciate, appreciate about your books is you found that balance, right? There is a, a wonderful academic rigor to it, but there is all it, rigor and accessibility are both present. Um, Dr. Bird, you've written some op-eds in the New York Times about this next question, which comes from our physics teacher, Ms. Uh, Disha. Uh, so I, I find this very fascinating as well. Hello, Dr. Bird. Uh, my question is about nuclear weapon policy and scientific research. So in your book, it's written that for a few years after World War II, scientists have been regarded as a new class of intellectuals members of a public policy priesthood who might legitimately offer expertise, not only as scientists, but as public philosophers. With Oppenheimer's defrocking, scientists knew that in the future they could serve the state only as experts on narrow scientific issues. According to your research, after World War II, what impact did Oppenheimer's career have on research in physics, especially on nuclear weapon policy and scientific research? Ah, well, you know, Oppenheimer once said that uh, during World War II, no physics was discovered. You know, everything that made possible the gadget, the first atomic bomb, in terms of the physics was discovered in the 1930s, and specifically with the discovery of fission in 1939. Um, what he did at Los Alamos was uh, assemble a huge team of people to work together on essentially what was an engineering project. Um, so, and then your other question about the, the role of the scientist as a public intellectual, I think is very important to, to us today. You know, we're, we're, we're a global society that is drenched in science and technology and we're now on the cusp of a, another scientific revolution, this artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, we have as human beings, it's, we're faced with many difficult choices in the coming years about how to use this technology. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I drive a car occasionally, uh, but I'm not a mechanic and I don't understand 
how it works. And on another level, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is going to just be within a few years is going to be all around us. And uh, we need scientists, we need the mechanics to explain to us how things are actually working and, um, and what choices we as a society have in terms of regulating the, this new technology. And that was true with Oppenheimer giving us the atomic age. He, you know, he understood that you could not stop science. You could not stop human beings from discovering the, the physical world around them. You could not stop human beings from discovering quantum on, and how to split an atom. Uh, that was gonna happen. If not in 1945, it would have happened a few years later. Um, and so he, his motivation, of course, was to build that gadget before the Germans, before the fascists got it and gave it to Hitler. That was his personal motivation. But as a scientist, he, he never thought that you could stop human beings from making more scientific discoveries. But he spent, you know, within three months of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he was making speeches as a public intellectual, trying to warn people of the dangers of this technology. And, you know, he was quite explicit. Uh, he was saying, you know, these are weapons of terror, weapons for aggressors, weapons that were used on essentially an already defeated enemy. Uh, and it would be a tragedy if they're ever used again. Well, no one listened. And of course, the more he spoke out, the more um, political enemies he made. And this is why he was brought down in 1954 in this terrible kangaroo court of a trial. Um, and that's that what happened to him in 1954 sent a message to all scientists, you know, to beware of getting out of your nar narrow lane of expertise, beware of of uh, becoming a public intellectual, beware of, of speaking about policy and politics because you could become a target. You could be brought down like Oppenheimer was. And so as a result here in America, I think it's a tragedy. We don't have, uh, we don't have scientific figures like Oppenheimer walking around mm -hmm. amongst us who are respected and given, um, deference to and are known they're they're not you know not many scientists operate as public intellectuals and i think that's because of what happened to oppenheimer and you can see during the pandemic most explicitly how this affected us where public health officials who were trying desperately to figure out what was the right scientific advice to give to um common citizens and how to survive this pandemic were attacked and their, their integrity was questioned and their honesty. And, uh, and I think this happened because the common man often to this day, though we are living with science and technology all around us, there's a certain distrust of scientists that, um, and, People would rather believe in conspiracy theories than listen to evidence and facts. And uh, that makes us vulnerable in a, in a vulnerable world. It's terrible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Thank you so much. Well, we are just about right on time. Um, and it is a school night. <laughs> so <laughs> students have to... Uh, get back to their residences, but uh, Dr. Bird, thank you. This was uh, th this was fascinating. Um, you've given us so much to think about. Um, we have your books in our library, so there's a lot to read. But having you here was just an absolute honor, delight, and a pleasure. So thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, reconnect with uh, Cody School and uh, with our students. And, uh, you know, we, we really hope that you can visit us 
uh, next year when you come to the Jaipur Literary Festival. Uh, at least you'll be back in India, so if you could make it up the mountain, we would love that uh, for you to come in person. Okay. So thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun and uh, a delight to reconnect. And I just want to urge all of you to go and read a biography. <laughs> it'll, it'll be a pleasure. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's an important intellectual adventure. Thank you, sir. Thank and you. I think, Mr. Justin, did you want to give a vote of thanks? or? <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Bird. I'm Justin from the English department uh, at KIS. On behalf of the entire KIS community, students, parents, alumni, staff, I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to you for making this possible and for sharing your time with us. Your achievements are a sense of great inspiration and pride for all of us uh, in the Kodi community. And I'm sure that all of us who attended tonight um, walk away with some form of le learning and growth a big thank you to Ms. Stephanie and the marketing uh, department, Ms. Manjusha and the alumni department, Ms. Shalini and the IT department, Ms. Somi and the admissions department, and of course the English department for helping organize this event. Finally, a big thank you to Mr. Corey, our principal and the panel, Ms. Ruth, Ms. Jisha, Ms. Amita, and our selected students for steering the discussion into such a rich and mean meaningful uh, direction. Uh, for all of those here in person, please join us for a quick snack outside. And depending on where you are in the world, good night or have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>